Well, thank you very much for, for coming out. Uh, it's always uh, great to start off our new seminar series. I've uh, had a great participation in the, in, over the, the last uh, couple of years from all different sectors of the campus and um, all different sectors of the, of the triangle. And even today, I'm sorry, I, I literally just ran across campus. Uh, and uh, I'm as good shape as I should be. Um, and also in, in uh, folks from uh, around the triangle. And we're, you know, see uh, several different people uh, from, uh, from across the triangle that are here. Some of them have to be here because they work for Alan. Um, others that uh, didn't know have to be here, but they're here anyway. So appreciate that very much. So one of the things that, that we started uh, four years ago when, when we started this Institute for Pharmacogenomics and Individualized Therapy is, is a way to try to acknowledge uh, those that have made our life easier. And uh, there, there really is not another venue to try to thank people uh, for the hard work that they've done that has made us uh, uh, able to have success um, that it really is, is making a high impact. And uh, so we set up three different awards uh, that, that identify people who have made contributions at the uh, clinical level, uh, at, the, at the public level, public health level, at the patient advocacy level. Um, and identify people, we have a, a committee of, uh, of faculty uh, from across the, the health affairs schools that, that vote each year on nominees uh, for, for this particular award. So uh, over the, the next three months, uh, the awardees will be coming in and giving our, our um, if it's seminar uh, as a, a way of, of uh, being highlighted, being receiving that award, as well as conveying uh, their, their current information. So. Uh, today, we're, we're going to be giving the, the award, uh, the 2010 IFID Award for, for Public Service. Now, this award annually honors a, a person uh, who has made significant contributions to the development of individualized therapy uh, to affect really public changes um, at, at the national, or in this case, international level. And um, past uh, recipients um, have done this uh, in a, a public health type format, um, have done this in a regulatory format, and uh, in, in, with today's example, we have someone who is, has done this uh, in, in the context of a, a, uh, a pharmaceutical industry uh, a format. Now, uh, Dr. Alan Roses is the 2010 recipient of the IFID Award for, for Public Service. And Alan is the Jefferson Pilot Professor of Neurobiology, Genetics, and uh, a member of the, the Duke Institute for uh, Genome Scientists and, Sciences and, and Policy. Uh, he is the, the director of the Dean uh, Drug Discovery Institute and a senior scholar with the Health Sector Management Program at the Duke University uh, Fuqua School of, of Business. Previously to this appointment, um, Alan was the senior vice president for genetic research and pharmacogenetics at GlaxoSmithKline. <laughs> and then before going to, to uh, a, a series of Glaxo companies, um, he for 27 years uh, was uh, was on faculty at Duke University uh, with a, a number of different titles, including being the, the, the chairman of the Department of, of Neurology, uh, one of the founding members of the Alzheimer's Center, one of the founding members of the Center for Human uh, Genetics. Uh, Alan Holtz, uh, uh, MD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He completed his residency training in neurology at the New York Neurological Institute at Columbia University and was the chief resident in division of neurology at, at, at Duke University. He also was a fellow, an honorary fellow of the Royal College of, of Physicians, uh, which was bestowed on him uh, in 2002. And those of you that are familiar with that, um, it's just one of the, the UK, United Kingdom bodies uh, that, that uh, oversees the, the, the practice of, of medicine uh, for, for that country. Now, Dr. Rose's vision at, uh, at GSK uh, really was a major driver for the, the field of individualized therapy. And part of the, the reason uh, that, that he was able to drive things forward uh, was be because he wasn't content with the usual way of, of doing business. Uh, there are many in this room that over uh, non-alcoholic beverages um, have, have really highlighted that the field was driven forward by Alan and many of his colleagues, some of who are, are here in this room. Uh, many, uh, 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 many drug companies other than GSK started and continued their pharmacogenetics and individualized therapy effort to try to keep up with Alan um, because he was having so much success at GSK and they, and they wanted to make sure that they uh, got a piece of that action. And so a lot of what he has done has certainly included understanding uh, disease genomics and he will talk a bit about some of that work 
um, today, especially with the, uh, the, the Alzheimer's disease example. Understanding pharmacological uh, genomics in terms of, of drugs uh, involved with transport, uh, metabolism, glucuronidation, foundation, et cetera, of, of medicines. And then also immunogenomics, with the most famous example uh, being the, the use of HLA B5701 genotyping prior to the prescription of abacavir um, as a way to avoid severe hypersensitivity reactions and uh, give the benefit of suppression of the virus. And so this, his advocacy of pharmacogenetics and personalized medicine uh, throughout his career has really put the individual patient in a place of, prior, a place of priority and brought a, a legitimate, legi legitimacy uh, both uh, to the research and practice of this area. So Alan, if you could uh, come up here. I, I uh, left you three minutes for your talk. <laughs> talk anyway. If you have any voice left, yeah, we've been talking to the death poor guy. There you go. So I'd like to present to you the 2010 um, IFIT um, Public Service Award. Thank you. No. Right. So I'll hang on to this. I'll try not to put it on eBay quite yet. <laughs> so, Alan? Oh, okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, first of all, this isn't my normal voice, and if I stop the cough, uh, it's only so I can go on to the next sentence. Uh, I'm going to essentially explain uh, one set of experiments. Uh, why we did it, how we did it, and uh, what it's leading to. And so this sort of has all the kind of key words that one would see uh, in modern medicine now. Translation, new genetic predictor marker, phase three, Alzheimer's disease prevention. But it's really two things. One, how, do, how is the marker found? Uh, and two, how is it going to be used? Uh, and I think uh, start from 1992, the laboratory at Duke that I uh, had w reported that there was an association of the APOE4 allele with Alzheimer's disease of the late onset common type. Uh, I'm not going to go into the history of all the uh, battles that, that ensued about that, but in fact, uh, it has stood the test of the last 18 years. And um, the bottom line of what APOE was known is very simply shown in this, this simple graph. There are three forms of APOE, two, three, and four. If your father gave you a four on one strand and your mother gave you your other strand and it was a four, then you were homozygous four, and this is the age of onset, and this is kaplan meierish kind of curve, so that 50% of the people will have developed their Alzheimer's disease around the age of 70. If you got a three and a four, then it's about 75. And if you got a three, Three, it looks kind of ragged here, and that's an interesting thing that we can explain later. But if you have this 3-3, uh, three, three, it's another eight years later. And if you have a 2-3, you got it much um, later. Not much was known about the effect of either 2 or 3, uh, and a lot was written about the neutralness of these other alleles. In fact, most experiments that were done showed some effect of APOE3 uh, in the biology. But uh, the one thing we could say is that if you were in the population and you had two E4s, that you had an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Your increased risk when you're 20 years old doesn't have much meaning. Increased risk when you're 60 years old begins to have an individualized meaning. Uh, so that's where we were. Too many buttons here. Okay. One of the things that happened in looking at uh, these data, we created animal models, uh, including APOE transgenic mice. 
And one of the fascinating things that was a huge argument back in the mid-90s was whether or not APOE was seen expressed within neurons in the central nervous system. There had been 12 papers written before 1994, and it was never seen by anyone. It was seen in the uh, glial cells, but not in the uh, neurons. All of these were rodents. Uh, the argument of the usual academic stuff of why we're not going to give you this grant is because APOE isn't found in neurons, and by the way. Uh, actually, it subsequently has been proven by a number of groups that it does, particularly in it, it's found in humans as people age. But there was an experiment in mice, which was kind of strange, because when we put in the cDNA into a transgenic on a background mice of APOE knockout, which was actually done here in the UNC, uh, we didn't see APOE3, APOE4, or APOE2 uh, uh, inside the cells, the neuronal cells. But when we did a transgenic that was based on a yak clones, we saw APOE in all the mice. Uh, and what that suggested to us was that it wasn't just APOE, but there was something else to it, and it was cis-acting. So there was something near uh, APOE in, in, the t in this uh, experiment, which was associated with a human pattern of intraneuronal APOE in transgenic mice. Now it's a different time. APOE is known, this is, for those of you who don't know, this is what you see in a piece of a whole genome scan. Uh, this is a color scheme. Uh, above 10 to the minus 8 is considered, after the correction for a million uh, uh, tests, is seen to be as accepted as uh, significant. In fact, the numbers for this in various experiments go up to 10 to the minus 152. Uh, what that actually means biologically is no more than it's very sure that this is a... Uh... Now, within this piece of DNA from the whole genome scan, you have some TOM40 clones, you have an APOC1 uh, clone, uh, but you don't see APOE. And the reason you don't see APOE on that is because we did not feel that APOE had the positive and negative predictive value to determine uh, anything except the relative age of onset. Uh, and we did not allow it because we had a patent at Duke for it to be placed on all these uh, uh, platforms that people are currently using. Uh, be that as it may, people who read this read this as the APOE peak because that's what had been previously found. Okay, everything in linkage. Oh, okay. okay, everything within the you find within the linkage disequilibrium peak is going to be found to be associated with Alzheimer's disease to some degree or another, not everything, but many of the variants in that region. How do you dissect? that region to see what the cis element really is. Uh, and so what we did is we did deep sequencing of the APOE-LD region in conjunction with phylogenetic mapping of the results. This experiment was performed in 2005 uh, within GSK, and we found something very, very interesting, which I'll show you, uh, but then it sat uh, for a while until I left GSK and could start the work you're going to hear about today. The approach enabled us to identify haplotypes of common ancestry which may be enriched for disease-causing variants. And one of the things that you need to know is that it isn't whether or not you have a 3 or a 4, it's what travels with the strand that you have. And phylogenetic mapping is a technique that uh, I learned my first day at GSK, 
at GW, uh, when I went through a list of 180 people who worked for me, and I found f f seven people who were listed as viral sequencers. And what the heck a viral sequencer was doing in a department that was going to do medical genetics, I didn't have a clue. And so the very next day, I went to visit those people in their lab. Uh, and uh, I got it educated. Not only were they seven people, there were only two viruses, HIV and influenza. HIV, they were looking at all the mutations that were occurring with respect to uh, drug therapy and a lack of uh, efficacy. Uh, for the other, for influenza, they were getting samples throughout the world, sequencing the virus, and determining by means of phylogenetic mapping what were the mutations that occurred in the subsequent, in, in that past year, which would predicted what they would use for creating vaccines. A real translation, real genetics based on the virus. Uh, why didn't anybody ever use this in humans? Well, at that time, we couldn't sequence humans. Uh, but now you can. Now there's a template, there's a way of looking across the whole human genome and attempting to find the region, the region that should be sequenced and phylogenetically analyzed. And for, for Alzheimer's disease, it was a no-brainer where to start. No-brainer, Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> so phylogenetic mapping is not an association screening strategy, but actually in, uh, defines in a rough way the temporal and positional order of mutations as they occur on a strand. GWAS reflects recombination of chunks of DNA using SNPs that give it some degree of information. Uh, while phylogenetics can describe the anatomy and the order of rare mutations on those backbones. The first experiment was to attempt to sequence the entire uh, uh, region of the LD. I had two very, very good large labs, well equipped uh, in two different locations in GSK, and neither one of them could long range clone it. It was a region around here where you couldn't get overlapping clones. Uh, the thing you do that about that when you control the budget and you're in GSK and you want to do an experiment is send it to six different laboratories, six or seven different laboratories, uh, for a fee for service, and you know he who can clone it, you know wins. And one laboratory out of those that was sent it to actually did do a complete cloning. And they did it by various tricks of short-range cloning in between. All of this is published. But essentially, this is the region that we're most interested in. So when we did the sequencing, what we found was that there are SNPs variants prevalent in all regions of the TOM40 gene. But in an intron, intron 6, there were essentially, f there were near each other four poly T repeats on each allele, on each strand. So you, re you get whatever the number of Ts are by the inheritance of that allele. And one of these, which is pictured here, is RS. Uh, this is RS1052453 and that actually gave a, a range of lengths from about 10 to about 40. Very significant differences that could occur on each of two independently segregating strands. And you'll see this number 922. 922 is this SNP. Uh, this is the 523 is the uh, poly T. And this is what the original data sort of looked like from uh, the work that was done in GSK. 922 was used as an arbitrary starting point. Uh, there would be a, uh, 
a, a branch for a clade here and a clade here, uh, another branch here for a clade, this would be a clade, there's some back cladening. Here, this would be uh, the other side of our uh, 922, and there would be these. And so what you actually had is a drawing of the temporal relationship between mutations that occurred, some rare, some common. And there were this stuff that looks like a pile of pancakes on various places. For everything that's at the, that place, this is the number of alleles or the number of strands that basically had that pattern. So there was something about these pancakes that were the same, but the initial, we, we named these A and B. And what we did is we then took the patients that made up the, the, uh, tr the sample base for Alzheimer's patients that we looked at and uh, just looked at what their genotypes were. And the genotypes here had 24% were the E4, E4, but the ones down here were 0% E4, E4. Some E4 was here and E3, E3. And so it looked like there was a concentration of most of the E4 alleles in people uh, who were in the upper A band. And then when there were cases and controls in this original uh, experiment. Two patients for each control, each gene of uh, each gene, APOE genotype. And this fell below two, and this went above two. And so this was enriched for patients with Alzheimer's disease. And that's where it stood when it was presented to the uh, essentially last R&D exec meeting that uh, Tashi Yamada had run, along with the game plan of what we wanted to do from there on. Things happened fast in the company, and it never got done within the company. There was no interest in it, uh, and um, went on to other things. Uh, however, when we when a, we re-sequenced a series of AD patients and controls, uh, and this is the original one uh, that we did subsequent to the one that we found it in. So here is the Arizona series. The DNA came from uh, Arizona, and what we found was that there were, this is the size of the repeat this is on the backbone of E3. This is on the backbone of E4. E4, E4, we know is not good for you uh, with respect to Alzheimer's disease. And these were longer than these, so we called these short and these long. But on the backbone of E3, there's also a group that was uh, very long. You can put these together and call them long, but semantically, there, there's some overlap here, but there's certainly no overlap with respect to the way the V3 the strands fell into what was connected cis to them. Okay, This is the Canadian series, which was analyzed after we submitted our, uh, well, after we asked for our co-authors' input from... Um, from GSK they, about these data, we then finally got permission to analyze these data, and this was the same story. This was a little bit larger series, but it has two cases here where a, an E4 actually fell into short. So 98% of the time, E4 is connected to a long 523, and that's bad. Okay. When we looked at the E3s that were in this group, all of them were the shorts. When we looked in this group, they were long. When we looked here, these were all E4s. 
And finally, and I'll come back to this little group later, another group of E4s. So here's your E3s, totally opposite. And here's your E4s that are long. So there are, okay. So the next question was, do the inherited poly T length sizes influence the phenotype of Alzheimer's disease? The expectation, the answer was obviously yes, or I wouldn't be here. Uh, well, maybe I'd be here if you were honoring me for something else. But I wouldn't be giving this talk. Uh, the only thing that we really knew hard and fast was the age of onset curves, which have been repeated now five or six times over the last 18 years. And uh, so one of the first things we wanted to look at was the age of onset of people who had 523 polymorphisms. If they're 4-4, 98% of the time that's going to be long. And the age of onset that we had done over these many times in the literature as well was an age of onset averaging about 70. But if you happen to have... Uh, an E3, E4, there were now two species of types of people you could have. A long four, long three, or a short three, long four. Okay? And we would expect, since the average age of onset in all those graphs, like the first one that I showed you, the average age of onset for three fours was 75. So if it's split into two forms, what we thought hypothesized would happen is that one of the long longs would look like the other long long, and a long short would look at something older than the average. And these are the data. So these are the very long longs. We're now at the good data, so I'll use green. These are the very long long, and these gave an average age, as expected, of about 70. This is the short long, gave an average age of about 78. And remember, the mix of all E4s was someplace in here. So when we looked at all patients, all APOE33 genotypes, uh, with no E4 and no E4, uh, E2 carriers. We wanted to be able to see the effect of APOE3 short set of alleles and the APOE4 very long set. So we examined APOE3-3 patients and are currently doing it from uh, a number of different uh, uh, groups of patients that have been uh, prospectively collected in a number of different places. But we looked at the ones that were immediately available to us and basically very long, very long. Three, this is three and four combined. Looking at the whole, not just three fours, but three threes and three fours. And this comes out to be 70 and this comes out to be about 75. Now these have been repeated, but this is an experiment that was done with Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. Richard Caselli is the uh, in investigator. And he had been following a group of people who were chosen or recruited uh, about five years previously, over the age of 60, who were normal when he started recruiting them. And he started to re uh, and serially each year examine people by neuropsychology and a variety of other clinical uh, examinations whether or not they were developing signs of dementia. Our prediction would be that the people who got it earlier would be those people who fell with an earlier age of onset. And so we would look for the difference between in, in three threes, there are three possibilities, very long, short, long, long, or short, short. So this is a graph of very long, very long. 
is the age of onset. This is not a lot of patients, but 22 patients uh, over that period of time, but it certainly occurs in an earlier rate than those with SS or SVL. Fact is, there were only two SS patients in this whole series, and they're here at the very end. So it gave us initial data that said that it was acting in an experiment that wasn't biased by the selection of people, gave us data that no other biomarker that's been tried in these experiments has come close to making predictions in individuals. There are now four other uh, prospective cohorts being looked at, and the ADNI imaging cohort is also being looked at. One of the reasons is that uh, there was an interesting study called the RAP, Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention. And this was a bunch of guys up in, uh, led by Mark Sager and Sterling Johnson, guys and gals, who uh, recruited a, uh, a group of 1,400 plus people who were at high risk of Alzheimer's disease as determined simply by the fact that they were the children of a person who had Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Nothing special there, but you know there is an increased risk been reported for people whose parents have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and they also had a you know, few people who they included who were not at high risk. So they looked at clinical biomarker effects in this group for the last, for the previous four years, and basically found nothing that correlated, whether they looked at uh, MRI, whether they looked at serum amyloid, whether they looked at CSF amyloid, whether they looked at tau. None of these things found any correlation. Um, but we were contacted by them, and they wanted to know, would the genetics predict any biological correlates in a prospectively collected normal population, retrospectively looking at their 523 genotypes. First of all, if you look at their APOE 33 subjects only, so these are the people uh, in the first half of the group that was uh, looked at, there is this same pattern with short and very long. It's easier to see when the four fours are not sitting right there, when the fours are not there. One of the things that they found was that the regions where gray matter par parametrically declines is in the VL, v, in the long lungs. Uh, these are 100 and... Uh, Six, not all three threes, but, uh, and this is essentially the mapping of the MRI data for several uh, parts. This particular graph is the left posterior hippocampus, but there's graphs of other places in the, in the brain. But this is what they had before, where they couldn't make heads or tails of what these data meant even using age as the parameter. And this is now the short shorts are blue, the short very longs are green, and the long longs. Now the ages here do not go above 65. These are normal people. These are not the ones that develop something during the course of it. This is all the people that remain normal. And this is the data shown in averaging where you can see that there's a bigger decrease over that period of time uh, with the uh, long, long, which would be predicted. And this is the same thing for the uh, left singular cortex. In this group, there were also many neuropsychological uh, tests done, those that are commonly followed 
in patients with Alzheimer's disease or are used subsequently when people have MCI or Alzheimer's disease. One of them is called the verbal memory test. And what they have shown as in the, and it's divided into the total group and the MRI subgroup. But if you're very long, very long compared to short, short, is statistically significant difference in the verbal memory task in normal functioning people based on their genotype and normal function of people based on not only the MRI subgroup, but many of these people didn't have an MRI, and you saw the exact same thing. Another question we ask is why do different ethnic populations have different kinds of Alzheimer's disease? There's a big hubbub about APOE and Alzheimer's disease in Japanese and Chinese populations in the mid-90s until it was found that the allele frequency in Caucasians was 15%, while the allele frequency in Far Eastern group was about half that. So therefore, they had less earlier onset, late onset cases than Caucasians. And if you just looked at the four fours, four fours then would be 15 squared, be about 2.25% of the population of Caucasians, where if it were 0.5, it would be 0.49%. So 0.5 to 0.7. And this basically is some studies that were done. What we were asking, could the variation be predicted or observed by the variation in the phylogenetic evolution of strands in different populations, okay? Now you can look at somebody who's from the Far East and raised, the, you know, born and raised there, and somebody in the United States, and they look different. So yeah, differences occur. But are one of those differences, or is one of those differences, that the allele frequencies of APO, excuse me, of the 523 polymorphisms different? So this basically shows the Caucasian group. It's APOE three linked, the fours are not on, uh, 523 in healthy Caucasians, Japanese, Han Chinese, and Korean. And what you can see is there's a trend for there to be shorter longs. Okay? There are shorter lungs that barely appear here, but are quite frequent in these other populations. Shorter is good, later onset. And one of the things that we found in the Caucasians that was different, this is now on the backbone of APOE4, in Caucasians, Han Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans, is that this clade, which is a shorter clade than this, was missing, essentially, in the Far Eastern group. Now, remember this? And I said I was going to come back to it. This group is not in the evolution of the Far Eastern groups that we looked at. We also looked at folks from Ghana, uh, and uh, basically there are differences there, but the most striking difference here was the sample has a, an area uh, is 22% APOE2. So we don't have the data for APOE2 yet in the Caucasians because our worry about them is they get the disease after the risk period anyway. We can only measure differences in risk up to 87 years of age, uh, and that we would concentrate on validating the data first from three and four. But it does tell you something if you're in drug development. It makes a difference 
when you add mix groups. If you do a trial for Alzheimer's disease and you're looking, for instance, at the rosiglitazone trial that was done uh, for uh, Alzheimer's disease treatment uh, by GSK, uh, the first study that was done that provided very positive data for people without an E4 allele uh, was done all in Caucasians. In the next study that was done, 35 to 40 percent of the people in that study were from China. They have a very different inheritance. To be classified as a function of their APOE4 into the different groups skews the data tremendously. And in that particular study, it showed a broader view and there was no uh, significant difference. Okay, we're not really here to talk about treatment, or, but one of the things that we're, what I'd like to explain to you now is the trial. So we want, the goal was to translate this into a, uh, a, a trial. So what we did is we decided by having a private company called Zinfandel, who has one employee, one owner, and I pay all the bills. Uh, to take this in front of the Voluntary Exploratory Data Submission Board of the FDA. It was called the OPAL trial because one of my folks came up with the name Opportunity to Prevent Alzheimer's. Uh, so the short for this is the OPAL trial. And what we did is we asked the FDA to work with us in creating a template for a trial that they would find acceptable for any drug that purported to be able to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And we suggested, well, what we originally suggested is pretty much what we ended up with, but uh, there was a lot of discussion. I don't have really time to go into it, although it's kind of interesting. But basically, the way the trial would be designed is we would collect patients, or excuse me, subjects, from population sources, 22,000 people over the age of 55 registered in Kannapolis, uh, thousands of patients in, uh, from Tomsk, Siberia, another group from Basel, Switzerland, another group from London, another group from various places, but their ascertainment was simply by their age, over age 60, uh, and whether or not they would be excluded because of anything that was going to kill them uh, that could be foreseen uh, as possibly not putting them into a five-year trial, uh, but who were considered normal. They were originally called and basically they were asked, uh, high, we, we paid students for instance, in the polyclinic of, uh, in Tomsk, Siberia, we paid the students 100 rubles an hour to call people from the registry. They have electronic medical records there, by the way, which we don't have here in the United States, generally. And uh, narrow it down almost randomly or randomly uh, to those people who were thought to be normal. And they would get them on the phone and they'd say, hi, the, you know, Mrs. Novitsky, uh, this is so-and-so, I am at your uh, polyclinic, and we're looking to participate in study prevention of Alzheimer's disease. Do you know what Alzheimer's disease is? They would either say yes or no, and they'd get the same spiel. Okay? So we explained to them, they said, the reason we're interested in is not, we don't believe you have Alzheimer's disease. You're, we believe you're normal and we would like to see if a drug can prevent it. If we were to do a study of Alzheimer's disease within the next two or three years, could we call on you to participate in such a study? Well, thousands of patients have now been recruited and are waiting for the gong to sound for the ability to do that study. They would be recruited because of their 
uh, oops, they'd be recruited because of their age and their health and the fact that they were normal mentally. They would get the diagnostic. In this case, uh, we would be using the 523 uh, and the APOE because it does make a difference in the middle groups uh, to tell somebody at the age that they present between 60 and 87, you are at high risk or low risk of starting out, so we wouldn't tell them this, but this is how they're being selected, high risk or low risk of being selected, of, of getting a cognitive impairment starting within the next five years. This is not a diagnostic. This doesn't say, yes, I have Alzheimer's. No, I don't. This is a predictive biomarker, genetic biomarker, that we believe predicts risk as high and low. Those people would be randomized to treatment and placebo. This group would be placebo and placebo. The initial discussion is, well, why don't you validate it first? To validate this first is a cost of approximately $25 million in six years. And our argument to that was, do we tell the American public that we can't go through these hoops first before we can actually try, try the trial based on our research validation? We're the ones spending the money. We're the ones at risk. And we would guarantee that we would have it validated. The test that we would use clinically would be validated uh, during, the, during the trial. And they said yes. Uh, now, if the treatment, no matter what the treatment is, doesn't work at all, you have more data for valid, validating the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. And by the way, if you have all their 523 data, we can start looking into, is it just short, long, and very long? Or is an individual who has two relatively equal pieces different from people who have either a very long and a very short? In other words, what are the interactions? We're talking about 5,000, 4 to 5,000 people, perhaps, uh, at least four. And uh, we will have enough data to be able to then show clinical utility as the test of a risk for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and that's the goal. Obviously, that's one goal. The other goal is to find a treatment as fast as possible. Now, the criteria for the treatment is that it has to be safe. Something that comes through drug discovery, brand new, put on the market, doesn't have the track record of being safe. It has to be a drug that's been out there a while and has a record of safety. Uh, now, there may not be anything in your particular theory of Alzheimer's disease that fits that, but there happens to be with our particular theory of Alzheimer's disease. This was determined by the FDA, endorsed on the 7th of October. Uh, this would give sub substantive evidence of a single, adequate, and well-controlled clinical investigation. If it works, this is a registration trial, a single registration trial. There's been a lot of biomarker stuff in the literature, and I'm going to close by just briefly going over some of the, and I I want to use a nice word rather than what I usually would say, but some of the stuff uh, that's out there. So there have been several biomarkers, including CSF 1 to 42 levels, MRI changes. These two things were recently proposed in a uh, Alzheimer's Association NIA uh, white paper to be predictive of age of onset by measuring in early patients. So they measured people who had uh, uh, MCI, and they found that they got a, a curve that would uh, say which people in, uh, with MCI uh, would be more likely to get Alzheimer's disease. They published an eight-page paper in Lancet, 
and this is the sum of their data. This is a, a beta. This is tau. This is brain structural MRI. This is memory, and this is clinical function. The age. Oh, there is no age. The age people were measured to start with were here. All of this is hypothetical. The age at which people have developed is hypothetical as well, as you're using groups of people who may have different development rates. In fact, you already know that if you take care of MCI patients, because only half of them get MCI in the next five to seven years. What happens to the other half? They get it later. So these things are not these beautiful curves that you see. But in the context of OPAL, where we're starting with a normal group of various ages, we know that everybody's age, we know that they're going to be tested to be normal to be in that group, and they're going to be randomized on the basis of a non-changing genetic marker. We can ground, anchor, whatever word you want to use, these other potential biomarkers to see how useful they are. What is their positive predictive value? What is their negative predictive value? Rather than changing the practice of medicine, proposing to change the practice of medicine, now, based on doing studies with these markers. So it's designed to test this, which would include uh, these other markers. Uh, finally, I'm not going to have time to go into the biology of this, but basically we are looking at poly T changes in other complex diseases. Uh, sequencing these regions was not very good, neither was complete long-range sequencing of the uh, whole genome. Uh, it turns out that next-generation uh, sequencing falls apart after 10 to 12 repeats, and so they wouldn't pick up these differences. So the point is, where do you start, what, where do you hone in, and where do you think that you can do this by phylogenetic mapping? And that will be what the Dean Institute will be doing for a number of years. Let me tell you something about Tom Forty in the final 60 seconds. Tom Forty is the channel, the outer mitochondrial membrane, Tom Forty, channel through which all peptides and proteins that go into the mitochondria to produce new mitochondria have to pass. Okay, it's called the open channel. There is something out there that in the textbook, and this is the Biology of Cancer 2007, has this great name, pro apoptotic death signals. Nobody knows what they are, but there's something that's interfering with the function of Tom Forty. And by the way, this has been studied in the Gladstone Institute, where in fact fragments of, Tom, of, of APOE3 and APOE4 uh, do affect the functioning of this channel. Uh, they affect, and they can distinguish also the way that the dynamics occur with mitochondria within cells. The, person who's written most about this is Yawang Y, Yadang Wang, H-U-A-N-G, uh, with the first name Y. And all this is very beautifully published. Okay, this is the group I'd like to thank for this, including a couple of folks that were in the GSK pilot study. This is a group at the Dean Institute. This is from the Bryan ADRC. This is the Arizona ADR, ADCC from Polymorphic DNA, which is now offering at a very uh, cheap rate the ability to anybody who's doing research to have this done at Polymorphic, approximately $16 to $22, depending on whether you want APOE with it or just uh, 523.
per patient. 1,000 patients, 20. And the Dean Drug Discovery Institute is supported by a gift from the Dean Institute and one of the uh, APPA, or I know, ARRA uh, grants, uh, challenge grant. So thank you, President Obama. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Questions for Alex? I had a massive heart attack in 1990, and I was in the intensive care unit for three weeks. During that time, or about three weeks, during that time, APOE, isoelectric focusing, was done on me because it was considered a risk factor. Um, this was pointed out to me when I laid down the rule in my lab that nobody can type, nobody running APOE can run their own or anybody else's in the lab or any of their friends. And the reason is because I would fire you. Uh, and one day I did. Came in and found somebody who ran their own DNA, a young girl, crying, very upset. She wanted to talk to me. She had this big problem. Uh, and she told me that she was an APOE 4-4. So I said, that's not your current problem. That may be a problem for you 50 years from now. Right now, you've lost the job. Yeah. So yeah, I knew my own uh, APOE when I looked at my medical record. It didn't mean anything in 1990, 91, or 92. But we traditionally did not allow people to, to do it. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the ethics of the stuff on the web being wrong or you know, all the kinds of things about this. I think measuring it when you're 20 years old is a waste of time. 40 years old is a waste of time because in the next five or six years, there are going to be this and other studies done based on this FDA-approved or accepted template that maybe will have a treatment that will change the course of the disease and can be detected to do that in the course of a pharmacogenetically assisted clinical trial. Then you may want to know when you're 50 years old. And maybe you want to take it earlier. And so the next five years are going to be looking at different age groups. Can you provide a little bit of an explanation of the divergence of Yeah, well, we'll be looking at that. Clearly, we have to do a study in a Far Eastern population. But we're going to do that in the populations that share the inheritance and the evolution of the, the marker, not a mixed bag that's taken off on a different marker, which turned out to be not as good as this one. If you look at it another way, forget APOE was ever found. You now have three marker systems, long associated with APOE4, short and, and very long. Just do it that way. So the guy who you know found APOE wasted all our time. <laughs> Part of the question I think was around uh, why these differences have sequestered geographically. Do you have any postulation around that? It's called evolution, and there are different evolutionary groups. So one of the things we're doing in in Siberia, uh, where it's a big place, and there are a lot of people who have been isolated in the middle of what we think of as no nothing out there, but there are people that have strange names, uh, groups of people, uh, who have taken the northern route or the southern route to China and to northern Japan and uh, in Korea. And those people have been collected and will be studied at the Medical Institute of uh, the Siberian Medical Genetics Institute in Tomsk. There's also other, uh, we want to look at the uh, whether the Eastern and Western evolution in the uh, African population uh, segregates and where it starts to segregate. We'll be looking at the Ethiopian Jews that uh, are in Israel. So a lot of things we're going to do, uh, but the first thing that we're going to do is to do a study. 
and the transaction for that study is ongoing. I haven't discussed the drug, I haven't discussed the details, but we expect to be able to start this study in 2011. It means you have more people in the low risk that are not getting drug, and you don't confound what you uh, would get from the low risk group. If you were going to do a drug trial without the pharmacogenetics, you'd do it on everybody and you'd randomize everybody, and it would be contaminated by, you know, let's say 50% of the people who are low risk. So we're doing it on the high risk group to see a signal. And when we get that signal refined, we can start looking much more exactly at who is really at the low risk, and hopefully we'll have a drug to treat them. Now, how they're going to get counseled and how the world is going to respond to this is, uh, you know, quite a different thing, and you never see me quoting. You know, I don't get involved in those kinds of discussion. We are fixated on getting a drug to prevent it. Alzheimer's disease, and you have to go through an interim period where you don't have the treatment. Starting from my early days in muscular dystrophy, when we found dystrophin and the treatment was just around the corner, there there was a reason so that we could look and see whether somebody was a genetic carrier uh, and whether you believed it or not should have her, uh, some, some people decided only to have girls. There was all sorts of ways of handling this, all of which present constant genetic uh, problems for agreement amongst geneticists and certainly amongst the public. But I think one thing that we can agree on is that if this shows that there is an effect in delaying, and it's a statistically significant effect, and a drug is out there, then there is a potential reason for getting tested and, you know, according to the, uh, uh, this, this would, you know, this would create a market for the test. So the marketing of this is we've licensed Polymorphic to do it for whoever has legitimate research samples to send the study samples. They will get an answer back usually within a week, okay, cheaply. We will not license it as a clinical diagnostic until we have the data from this study. We will use it with the clinical diagnostic laboratories that we may, that would get a license to be able to do additional research based on what we get from this study. So something that we could design now that would go through a capillary and be read out may be very, very different and much more accurate or the need for that maybe after we see the results of this. But the licensing for commercial uses is one of the things that Zinfandel will try to control. We'll take one short last question. Alan's going to be available. There's some, uh, leave some food and drinks out. out. I'll be available for a little while to mingle and ask additional questions, but Matt will give you the... Uh, just another question on this trial. So how large, to accomplish your goals, how large will this trial have to be? Approximately what age are you going to try and recruit patients, and how long is this going to have to run? Well, we, uh, we proposed it and did the calculations, as the folks in regulatory do all the time. Uh, we did the calculations based on what we knew about it and came out for a five-year trial. We needed 384 people in each group. We decided to do a thousand. Why do we decide to do a thousand? Because recruiting normal people isn't fourteen thousand dollars a head, and it isn't the big R bite that it is for a disease. Prove to me you have the disease, so we treat it. We're testing that they don't have disease. We've got thousands of people on our waiting list. The goal is take the first six months after the IND, get their baselines done if they haven't already been done. And, uh, and go from there. 
and what age, what age are the 60 to 87. It's kind of arbitrary. Above 87, you know, the only thing that we happen, most of what we see is 2, 3, and 3, 3, and those 3, 3s turn out to be short shorts. So, I mean, uh, that part of it is kind of obvious. What you need to know, just to make it a little bit more interesting, is why do some 2, 3s get disease and others don't? 2 is essentially doesn't have the proaptotic effect because it has two cysteines and binds to itself and it doesn't cleave in the same place to have the pro effect. So it's really a null, and whichever three you get puts you on that curve. And as I said 10 years ago or 20 or whatever it was, 12 years ago, I have never seen a verified case of 2-2 two -two Alzheimer's disease. So that will thank you, Ellen, for